INEX declares Alex Oti of the Labour Party winner of March 18th governorship election in Abia State. Nigeria Labour Congress directs public sector workers to embark on strike from Wednesday next week over cash crisis. Court dismisses application by suspended Deputy Commissioner of Police Abba Kieri seeking to strike out drug charges against him. On the foreign scene, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky visits front line near Bakhmut, where fires fighting rages on. Good evening, this is News at 7 on Western Spring Television. My name is Evelyn Ohiole. Alex Oti of the Labour Party has won the March 18th governorship election in Abia State. He defeated his opponents like Oke Ahiwe of the People's Democratic Party PDP and Eyinaya Nwafo of the Young People's Party YPP. Mr. Oti scored 175,467 votes. Mr. Ahiwe scored 88,529 votes, while Mr. Nwafo got 28,972 votes. Returning officer of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, in the state, Professor Nana Naya Oti, declared Mr. Oti the winner this evening at the reception of the final coalition of governorship election results in Umwaya, the Abia state capital, over 48 hours after INEC suspended the exercise in the southeast state. The last time the Labour Party produced a governor in the last 20 years was when Olusha Gumimiko was elected Undo State Governor in February 2009. Oti, Alex, Chioma of Labour Party, having certified requirements of the law, is hereby declared the winner and is returned elected. Thank you. Labour Party governorship candidate in Lagos State, Badebor Rhodes Viver, has rejected results of the March 18th election, insisting that there was no election in the state. He described the March 18th governorship election in the state as one marred with violence. He said this while addressing the media today. Mr. Rhodes Viver also responded to President-elect Bola Tinubu's call for healing, stating that healing cannot happen without justice. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, had announced candidate of the All Progressives Congress, APC, Babajide Sawolu, as the winner of last Saturday's election in the state. Bola Tinubu called for healing. But healing cannot happen without justice. The APC unleashed evil on Lagosians, spiritual, spiritually, with their fetish diabolic rites that were done during the day, and physically, with violence that was unleashed on all Lagosians. There's an attempt to make this seem as though it was a Yoruba versus Igbo situation was limited to certain areas, but it was widespread across the whole of Lagos, from Koshofe to Shomolu to Ikeja. Everybody was affected. Everybody was disenfranchised. Yet they want peace, but it's not really peace that they want. They want the peace of a graveyard. They want healing without addressing the issues of bringing justice, so they want the healing of the dead. 
The thrust of my message is not to the evil cult organization of the APC, but it is to the indigenous Lagosians and Lagosians at large. We cannot afford to have an agbirocracy, a militant type of government in Lagos State. We all believe that we have gone past this type of politics. We all believe that democracy has been deepened. But we saw not just violence and diabolic means of trying to restrain and belittle the people of Lagos to create a one-party state all the way from Ikoi to Ikeja to Ikodu were all disenfranchised. They could not campaign based on their past record, so they stoked ethnic strife. For the ambition of one man and his cult, the entire credibility that INEC had built over the last four years was ripped into shreds in one day. In River State, Governor Yesem Wike says it was not against candidate of the Labour Party, Peter Obi, becoming president. The governor said his main goal was to have a southerner become president. Candidate of the All Progressives Congress APC, Bola Tinubu defeated Mr. Obi and Atiku Abubakar of the People's Democratic Party PDP in the February 25th presidential poll. Speaking during a media chat today, the previous governor said there was no agreement in place for him to work for Mr. Obi. Governor Wike said he supported Mr. Obi as the vice presidential candidate of the PDP in 2019. He said the G5 governors of the PDP fully committed to ensuring a southern candidate is elected president. Governor Wike also berated the PDP national chairman, Iyocha Ayu, for failing to deliver a state Benue for the party. I don't work for any. I don't have any documents with me. I'm not an ad hoc staff of INEC, and so I'm not in a place to reach election for anybody. It's where you have the materials of INEC that you cannot talk about rigging. But I take exception to Peter B's comment that I came out against him. People are not being sincere, people are not being, uh, 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 you know, people are not appreciative. In 2019, P2B. I was one of the team that chose P2B to be the vice presidential candidate of Elijah Tugamba. When we met in Elijah Tugamba uh, the house, he said, these are the names. I will choose P2B. P2B was invited when we were in Pierre, uh, uh, Saraki's house in the night. In the meantime, the People's Democratic Party PDP Governorship Screening Committee for Bielsa State has cleared Governor Doya Diri for the November 11, 2023 governorship election in the state. The screening exercise took place at the PDP headquarters in Abuja. The incumbent governor of the state was the only aspirant from the party that picked the PDP nomination and expression of interest firms for the November poll. Chairman of the Screening Committee and Edo State Deputy Governor Philip Shaibo said the panel screened Governor Deary in line with guidelines of the party and as stipulated in the electoral law. It said the governor met all the requirements of the party for the election. Elsewhere, lawmaker representing Kano North in the Senate, Senator Jibrin Barao, has officially announced his intention to run for the position of the President of the Senate in the 10th National Assembly. His declaration is coming a day after the Senate Chief Whip, Senator Aji Uzokalu, said it is his turn to be the Senate President of the country. Speaking to journalists at the National Assembly, Senator Barao said competence, capacity and experience should be the factors to determine who should be the president of the Senate in the 10th Assembly. Other senators-elect who have signaled interest in the position of Senate president include Gotwil Akbabio and David Humayi. I tell you that I intend to seek to be the president of the Senate of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 
10 senators of the of Nigeria. I will, uh, in a few days, or maybe in a week or two weeks' time, uh, make formal declaration. But I want to tell you, this is my intention. I intend to be the president of the 10th Senate of the Federal Republic of Nigeria by grace of God, God willing. The legislature is a distinct arm of government that works on, uh, um, it doesn't work on sentiment. It works, it works on your ability to do the job. Your ability to do the job. It is the principle, is it, it is the um, tradition all over the world. So, um, is there in our rules? Is there in our rules that, and this rule is a product of the Constitution. Section 60 gives the Latitude National Assembly to create means of regulating its procedure, including summoning recess, I mean, summoning the, 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 the Houses of Assembly, that is the Senate and the House of Reps, and then the recess as well. And that gives, you know, and that gives us the reason why we have our standing rules. And it's clear in the standing rules that aspiration or election for the office of the Senate Presidency shall the Committee to Protect Journalists says at least 28 journalists and media workers were harassed and attacked while covering the state and House of Assembly elections held on March 18th. In a statement, the organization cited several cases of attacks experienced by journalists across the country, adding that security officials present did not intervene. It said at least 10 unidentified men punched and used sticks to hit a TV crew with a privately owned broadcaster, Arise TV, after they used a drone to film voting stations in Lagos State. CPJ called on Nigerian authorities to investigate the incidents and hold the perpetrators to account. Following the conclusion of the 2023 general election, many Nigerians have been speaking about the conduct of the polls. In this report, Olayinka Ale spoke with some Nigerians to get their opinions about the election. Nigeria held its presidential and national assembly elections on Saturday, February 25th, 2023, across all the 36 states of the Federation and the Federal Capital Territory. And also the gubernatorial and state house of assembly elections was conducted on Saturday, March 18th, 2023. It was the most competitive election since the country's return to democratic rule in 1999, the seventh in the cycle. It was also the election with the lowest turnout. Report says just about 25.2 million voters voted in the election. Many commentators have attributed the low voter turnout to voter suppression, voter intimidation, and the scarcity of money and fuel, although those may not have been serious reasons for voter apathy. While some Nigerians assess the election as free and fair in terms of INEC conduct and security, some were disappointed and claimed INEC was incompetent. Fatai Adirinto and Shesson Babatunde in their separate submissions agreed that the election was a free and fair one, commending the INEC for the use of the Beaver's machine and also the federal government for securing the lives and properties of the citizens. security. Uh, so what try that? What try? I we not dead that day. No one bad you want bad you want daddy, what daddy, you want debo. What's everything? What debo for so you to you know made those are near that because you do call uh president wanna worry what try no pass security. Governor wanna also said no, we not try demola delicate, what try when you security. So what double bo do ya at me wa so you call for you bar. So unless I have law both say oh yeah, both say Anyway, the NS try their own ability, no that's all. But uh, I can see that the lesson goes smooth, they try their best, but they try their own capability, no ability. But in my own view, I never try, I can give just 75 percent. Total, I can give just 75 percent. If you want anything about the lessons they give. So you see the winner, you see the loser, you see the two. Anything about politics is good. Similarly, Atoye B. Oluwashala felt the election was a free and fair one, particularly because he felt people came out to vote their preferred candidate. But for Lamik Mosi Oloniyo, the case was different because she felt INEC was not up to the task. According to her, both Beaver's machine malfunctioned 
and the security personnel was not much compared to what she expected. Actually, first and foremost, I'm um, really give thanks to the Mr. President for being given us the security in order to make everything to be very peaceful and we tired most of the people because they are come out and fought massively. So an uh, election that we did on the 25th of this uh, March 2023 was, uh, yeah, February. It's going to be a free and fair election. So I'm really give kudos, kudos to the those people that will be, because they come out and turn up massively and they've cut their votes for their people of their choice. Yeah, I think, let me start with um, the high neck. They didn't do well at all because people so much believe in them because um, the high neck chairman promised that the beavers was going to work perfectly and during the general election, especially the presidential election, we discovered that in so many polling units, most of the beavers didn't work. So most of them couldn't even upload their results at the polling units. They have to go to their um, branches to upload the result. So it didn't work where I thought. A public affairs analyst, Dr. Yinka and Jesus, said the election witnessed inadequacies from both the INEC and the security personnel. A pain on the malfunction beaver's machines and the result from some states. They tried their best, but you may not believe this. Their uh, performance was worse than the first. Because maybe because of the strength of the established major parties. They threw a lot of care to the win. They didn't care. They did everything they liked. To the extent that, do you know that even somebody was abducted in Zamfara? The wreck was abducted after the election was going one way. When it was released, it went the other way. Another observation I noticed is that was that there was this issue of one woman who was casting them, already been congratulated, but after the abduction, like I said, the whole story changed. Also in Ogun State, there were issues with INEC, which they, which they need to interpret to us, because some people felt they, would have, they should have declared inconclusive in Ogun State, but it was not to be. We had similar thing that inconclusive was declared in some other areas too, which some people felt they should have been declared. I will not forget the withheld result of, uh, of uh, Abia and Enugu State. Then you look at some of the uh, stronghold of would be political parties change. The security situation did not have issues. Then altogether, generally, if you ask me, I think we still have a long way to go as far as our electioneering issue was concerned. However, let us say this. We cannot totally blame the system because you find out that we are some political parties lost. They vilified the INEC. Where they won, they gave kudos to INEC. That's why I said all together we cannot because I have one cliche and I'm still yet to be controverted with that cliche that politics and fairness cannot cohabit. INEC has since declared Senator Bola Ahmed Chinubu of the All Progressive Congress as a president elect alongside all the candidates. Olainka Ali, Western Spring Television News. Moving to Gumba State, the police command has absolved Governor Muhammadu Yahya's thank you visit and jubilation from the killing of a 21 year old who was stabbed by suspected hoodlums. This man Adamu was killed and his phone snatched from him by his assailants at Angua Uku when the governor visited the area to say thank you to his supporters for their overwhelming votes. Confirming the killing today, Police Public Relations Officer ASP Mahid Abubakar said the youth's killing and had nothing to do with the jubilation. He noted that no arrest had been made, adding that investigation would confirm the cause of the killing. Earlier, father of the deceased, Adamu Ali, cried for justice, calling on law enforcement agencies to unravel the cause of the killing. Hoodlums have set ablaze a high court in Owutu Eda, a fifth south local government area of Eboi State. Registrar of the court, Oluchi Uduma, confirms the incident to journalists in Owutu Eda today. She says the hoodlums invaded the court yesterday and set the building ablaze. Ms. Oduma explains that the court building, documents and other valuables were completely burnt. Chairman of Afiko's South Local Government, Chima Nkama, said the attack 
has been reported to the police. You are still watching news at 7 on Western Spring Television. Still to come. Nigeria Labour Congress directs public sector workers to embark on strike from Wednesday next week over cash crisis. We'll bring you more on this when we return. Aminatu, the legendary queen of Zazao, is best known to historians as Queen Amina of Zaria, an old world town and capital of the Hausa state of Zazao. Amina was a great warrior and the first woman to rule the ancient kingdom of Zazao. Her 34 years as queen witnessed an unprecedented expansion of Zazao by conquests. Queen Amina of Zaria belongs to the class of Amazons by the might of Harami and her strings of conquests. She opened Zaria to trans-border trade and was said to have initiated kola nut cultivation in the ancient kingdom. The Hausa Muslim figure was born in 1533 and died in 1610 at the age of 77 years. Folklores remember Aminatu, the queen of Zazao, as a brave, smart and talented leader whose giant statue now adorns the National Arts Theatre in Lagos, Nigeria, while many educational institutions bear her name. Western Spring Television identifies Queen Amina as a watershed character in history. Fumilayo Ransom Kuti was an educationist and advocate of women's rights. She was recognized for her virtually comments against colonial policy of taxation as it affected the Nigerian women. Bere, as fondly addressed by her women followers, Fumilayo championed the initiation of universal adult suffrage, which gave an unprecedented leeway for women to contest elective offices and power to exercise voting rights. Married to a foremost educationist and teacher, Israel Oladoto Ransom Kuti, the first president of Nigeria Union of Teachers, Fumilayo Ransom Kuti was the mother of children who inherited her spirit of activism. Olufela and Be Ololari, the former, a renowned musical legend. She was the first female student of Abe Okuta Grammar School and the first female to own and drive a car in Nigeria. The award recipient of Member of Order of Nigeria MON and Lenin Peace Prize was born 25th October 1900 and was killed on the 13th April 1978 by rampaging road soldiers in Lagos. Western Spring Television identifies Fumilayo Ransom Kuti as a watershed character in history. Welcome back. This is Still News at 7 on Western Spring Television. A reminder of our headlines. INEC declares Alex Oti of the Labour Party winner of March 18th governorship election in Abia State. Nigeria Labour Congress directs public sector workers to embark on strike from Wednesday next week over cash crisis. Court dismisses application by suspended Deputy Commissioner of Police Abba Kiari seeking to strike out drug charges against him. On the foreign scene, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky visits frontline near Bakhmut where fires fighting rages on. The Nigeria Labour Congress NLC has directed public sector workers in the country to embark on strike beginning from Wednesday next week. NLC President Joe Ajero gave the directive at an ongoing media briefing at Labour House in Abuja today. He also directed that affiliate unions constituting the Nigeria Labour Congress should also be on standby for picketing exercise across all branches of the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, nationwide. 
It said the directive became imperative following the expiration of a one-week ultimatum given to the Apex Bank to make cash available for Nigerians. World War Today, held on 22nd of March every year since 1993, celebrates water and raises awareness about the 2 billion people living without access to safe water. Joseph Atewa reports that today's celebration comes in the wake of a United Nations report which warned of a looming global water crisis and an imminent risk of shortages due to overconsumption and climate change. Over 2 billion people live in water-stressed countries, which is expected to be excavated in some regions as a result of climate change and population growth. According to the United Nations, globally, at least 2 billion people use a drinking water source contaminated with feces, microbial contamination of drinking water as a result of contamination, which poses the greatest risk to drinking water safety. As we celebrate International Day for Water with a team accelerating the change to solve water and sanitation crisis, many residents like Kendi James say water pollution has almost forever been a big problem. He also believes government intervention should be speedy. Water pollution means uh, every uh, uh, the, the environment is very polluted with this rain, water, everything like that. So all those stuffs. So we don't like everything like that. So we want government to just find something to do with uh, all the water pollution all over this uh, government uh, vicinity. Recently, the United Nations report warned of a looming global water crisis and imminent risks of shortages due to overconsumption and climate change. In light of these, the general manager of Shun State Rural Water and Environmental Agency, Mr. Demola Online Waju, explained that people should be blamed for the increase in water population. According to him, the level at which residents vandalize government properties leading to damage is alarming. The, the problem uh, emanated mainly from uh, the quacks that were uh, that uh, engage in uh, uh, in the mining of uh, of gold uh, before government uh, really took a bold step there were a series of uh, 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 quacks that were mining gold uh, just anyhow it is understood that the world is blindly traveling a dangerous path of vampiric overconsumption and overdevelopment the general manager also disclosed that the government will continue to do our best so as to ensure the level of water pollution is drastically reduced and residents have access to clean water supply. The, the facility that government put in place for them, they should take care and uh, they should take care and maintain it as they have been uh, they have been uh, uh, they have been trained because we, we ensure that we train. Uh, users on how to maintain and sustain these facilities. The United Nations reports that roughly half of the world's population currently experience severe water scarcity for at least part of the year. It is believed that with the intervention of the government and people doing the writing, these ugly statistics will drop drastically in a very short time. Joseph Atewe, Western Spring Television. Now we move to legal matters. The Federal High Court in Abuja today dismissed an application by a suspended Deputy Commissioner of Police Abakiri seeking to strike out drug charges against him. In his ruling, Justice Emeka Nwite dismissed the application on the ground that the court has the exclusive rights and jurisdiction to hear drug-related cases as enshrined in the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency and the LEA Act. Kiaria told the court that the charges against him were premature, insisting that the NDLEA ought to have allowed police to exhaust its internal machinery before it instituted the action. He told the court that the police had already commenced an investigation into allegations against him and issued an interim report. Kiari U is a former head of the intelligence response team of the Nigeria Police Force is facing prosecution by the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLEA.
The Nigeria police force has confirmed the arrest of a social media influencer today in, in Namdi, who was arrested in Onitsha, Anambra State, on Saturday, March 18th, 2023. In a statement, Force Public Relations Officer Olumuwa Dejabi said today was arrested for cyber stalking. The police also revealed that he has been investigated by the Nigeria Police Force National Cyber Crime Center, Abuja, over a petition about his activities on social media, which contravenes the provision of Section 24 of the Cyber Crimes Prohibition and Prevention Act 2015 and other criminal laws. The force revealed that a prima facie case has been established against Chude adding that his case file has been forwarded to the court's legal department for further action. In other news, the Federal Executive Council has approved the sum of 5.1 billion naira for the construction of two accommodation facilities comprising 192 flats of various room capacities for personnel of the National Drugs Law Enforcement Agency. The facility, which will be located in Abuja, would take the two contractors hired for the project 60 weeks to complete. Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Abubakar Malami, revealed these to State House correspondents after the council meeting chaired by President Muhammad Buhari at the presidential villa Abuja. Mr. Malami premised the approval of the security and safety of the NDLEA's narcotics. Superintendents and assistants, whom he said have come under attack due to their increased anti drug campaigns. Talking education, the West African Examination Council, Nigeria, has said its newly unveiled educational statistics platform has a database of over 50 million candidates who have been tested over the years. Speaking at the unveiling of the EduStart, head of Nigeria office. Patrick Arega explains that for schools, the platform would offer student-level data on academic performance, attendance, and demographic information. Mr. Arega said the innovation was done to take the edge off the manual access to data to stakeholders, improving the quality of service delivery and generate more revenue for the council. Now for news outside Nigeria, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has visited the front line near Bakhmut where fires fighting rages on. The city has become a focal point of the war with Russia trying to capture it for months. Mr. Zelensky's visit comes after Russian forces attacked Ukrainian cities overnight, killing at least four people in a drone strike near the capital. A statement said the Ukrainian leader thanked troops around Bakhmut for their defense of the city and country. For more than seven months, Bakhmut witnessed fires fighting as Russian forces tried to make territorial gains to please the Kremlin. Twenty-five people have been injured after a ship tipped over an Edinburgh dockyard in Scotland. The Scottish Ambulance Service said 15 people had been taken to hospital and 10 people were treated at the scene of the incident at Imperial Dock, Leith. A major incident was declared after research vessel petrol became dislodged from its holding on a dry dock. Pictures posted on social media show the 3,000-ton vessel leading at a 45-degree angle. Scotland police urged the public to avoid the area to allow access for emergency services. Still in the United Kingdom, British Labour leader Sy Keir Starmer has criticised Prime Minister Rishi Sunak over security and crime as he paid tribute to a police officer, Keith Palmer, who was killed by a terrorist in Westminster six years ago. At Prime Minister's questions today, he asked the Prime Minister if he accepts the findings of the case review into the Metropolitan Police following rape allegations. Star Sir Sturmer also criticizes the government for not backing Labour's plans to have high-quality rape and sexual offences units in every police force. In response, Mr Sunak says the government will be working with the London Mayor and Met Commissioner to ensure culture, standards and behaviour all improve.
standards for recruitment in different police forces. No wonder the Casey report criticised what she calls the government's hands-off attitude to policing over the last 13 years. But let's call it what it really is, sheer negligence. The report also exposes chronic failures by the police to deal with rape cases, with officers using, and I quote, overstuffed or broken fridges containing the rape kits of victims. On his watch, rape charges are 1.6%. Yet the government still hasn't backed Labour's plan to have proper, high-quality rape and serious sexual offences units in every police force. Why not? The primary public accountability of the Met sits with the Mayor of London. She described that relationship between the Mayor and the Met as, in her words, dysfunctional. But when it comes... So I, I hope when he stands up, he will also confirm to the House that he will take up these matters with the Labour Mayor of London so that he plays his part. Mr Speaker, the way rape victims were treated by the criminal justice system wasn't good enough, and that's why the government published an ambitious rape review action plan. Yep. It's right that we've extended Operation Sorteria across all police forces in the country. We've tripled the number of independent sexual violence advisers. We've improved the process of collecting phone evidence and being cross-examined. And since 2010, we've quadrupled funding for victim support services. That is a Conservative government doing everything we can to support victims and tackle predators. In other news, African nations have been experiencing bouts of protests mostly that of opposition in the past few months, picking in the month of March 2023. The protests are said to be responses to their government's dealing with economic and other political problems being experienced on the continent. Daniel Odayemi completes the report. Protests have always been a tool to express disapproval to an action or position all over the world. Labor unions mostly engage protests as an expression or declaration of objection and disapproval of government policies over the years. While it has advantages, it can descend into chaos and turmoil depending on reactions and counter-reactions. Since the beginning of the month of March, reports emanating from Africa has been that of opposition protests causing worries about breakout of unrest in several African nations. The protests are said to be responses to their governments dealing with economic and other political problems being experienced on the continent. The largely opposition planned protests, some have said, are expected to test the line between civil liberties and security. In South Africa, not less than 87 people were arrested on Monday across the country over public violence before the planned protest by the left-wing Economic Freedom Fighters Party. The Economic Freedom Fighters, the third largest party in the country, has called for a national shutdown to protest crippling power cuts and demand the resignation of President Cyril Ramaphosa. Economic Freedom Fighters leader Julius Malima stated on Monday that the event is a mere expression of dissatisfaction with Ramaphosa's rule. To put on the picket lines, whether they kill or they don't kill, we will be on the streets of South Africa on Monday. This follows calls from the governing African National Congress, which downplayed the push for disruption of South Africa's economic workings, terming the protest as a recipe for anarchy. Also, South African police said that the planned opposition protests are not a mere shutdown, but an attempt to overthrow the government. It wasn't surprising when the police clashed with protesters, though Malima insisted that they would not be coward. South Africa has been experiencing one of the worst energy crises since 2017. The president had earlier declared a national disaster to tackle the dire energy crisis. The outages have been badly affecting homes and businesses for months. In Tunisia, protests have started as far back as 2022 over economic crisis before hundreds of opposition supporters defied an official ban on their protest against President Kais Saeed, breaking through a police barrier in central Tunis to rally in the city's main street in the first week of March. Before the protesters broke through the barrier, police warned them by loudspeaker that their demonstration was illegal, but added that they would not stop them by force. 
some of the leaders were arrested. The Free Distorian Party in Tunis headlined the demonstrations against President Kais Saheed's dissolution of parliament. They also accused him of planning to silently amend the constitution. Saeed has in the recent past accused African migrants of being part of a conspiracy to change Tunisia's demographic makeup amid a crackdown on migrants sparking criticism by human rights groups. In Kenya, opposition leader Raila Odinga rejected what he called intimidation from the government after he announced Monday, March 20th, as the beginning of protests to resist what he called a high cost of living, which he blames on government lethargy. He said that the March 20th demonstrations would be the mother of all protests and is expected to bring the country to a standstill. Odinga, who addressed the rally in Nakuru City, insisted that the planned protest would be peaceful. The Kenyan government, however, said it accepts peaceful picketing, but would crush violators. Though President Ruto assured his administration was not against protesting peacefully, the protests still declined into bitter clashes. With the flurry of protests sweeping across Africa, it is apparent that Africans are getting discontented with the economic and political condition of their milieus. But is protests the way to go? Reports indicate that heightened security measures and disruptions to transport and business are likely in areas where protests take place. Clashes are expected to occur, particularly if supporters of rival political groups come in close proximity to each other or if police attempt to forcibly disperse the crowds. Daniel Odeyemi, Western Spring Television. Still ahead... Federal Executive Council approves 453.9 billion naira for procurement of rolling stock and maintenance and equipment from Kano Maradi Standard Goods Rail Line. We have more on this and other business stories after this break. Please stay with us. On 16th September 1923, named Harry Lee Kwan and known as Lee Kwan Yew, he was often addressed by his initials of LKY. Lee Kwan Yew was a barrister and the first Prime Minister of Singapore between 1959 and 1990. Educated at Raffles Institution from 1936 to 1940 and the Fisa William House between 1947 and 1949, Lee Kwan Yew established a highly effective and anti-corrupt governance system that midwives the transformation of Singapore into a high net worth income economy within a generation. He never hid his exception to Western mode democratic ideal, which he believed had not assisted developing nations to attain good government. Before his death on 23rd March 2015, the People's Action Party, which he founded, had used his political influence to establish the United World College of Southeast Asia to expand his economic ideas among countries that constitute the Asian Tiger. Western Spring Television identifies Lee Kuan Yew as a major character in history. The name Adolf Hitler exudes a gale of bars from millions of people who are victims of his autocratic rule and love from fanatical supporters of his imperial aggression. Born April 20, 1889, at a small Austrian town sandwiched between Austro-German frontier, Adolf Hitler spent most of his childhood in Linz, the capital of Upper Austria. As a very prominent stakeholder in the horrific events of conflicts in Europe, Adolf Hitler could simply go off as the sole mover of the Second World War. 40 million Jews were murdered in the gas chambers of various Nazi camps on the orders of Adolf Hitler. Thousands of Adolf Hitlers still live in Germany today, but the majority of them are elderly and were named before the end of the Second World War. As the name pales into vanishing rarity, 13 children, according to official records, were named Adolf Hitler between 2006 and 2013. Western Spring Television identifies Adolf Hitler as a major character in history.
The Berlin Conference of 1884 defined the configuration of Africa, which hitherto existed as a continent of multiple kingdoms and empires under native rulers. The conference, otherwise referred to as Congo Conference, regulated European colonization and trade in Africa as initiated by German leader Otto von Bismarck. The Berlin Conference is often called the scramble for and partitioning of Africa as each of the imperial powers carved separate portions of the continent for themselves without recourse to racial and cultural identities and differences. 137 years after the Berlin Conference was held, Africa remains a legitimized playground for European nations that sought to exploit its wealth and resources and manipulate its human capital to promote trade and investments of Western powers. Western Springer Television identifies Berlin Conference as a major event in history. Welcome back now to business. The Federal Executive Council has approved 453.9 billion naira for the procurement of rolling stock operation and maintenance equipment for the Kano Maradi standard gauge rail line currently under construction. This also includes 510.93 million naira for the procurement of four customized fire service search and rescue vans and seaports at Port Accord, Lagos Port Complex, Tinka Island Port and the Marina headquarters of the Nigerian Port Authority. Minister of Transportation Moazo Sambo disclosed these two State House correspondents after the council meeting chaired by President Muhammad Buhari at the presidential villa Abuja. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, says it has reached an agreement with Ukraine and funding worth $15.6 billion. The organization's first loan to a country at war is expected to be approved in the coming weeks. It would also be one of the largest financing packages Ukraine has received since Russia's invasion. The IMF recently changed a rule to allow loans to countries facing exceptionally high uncertainty. FC Porto defender Zaidu Sanusi has linked up with his teammates in camp ahead of Nigeria's 2023 Africa Cup of Nations qualifying doubleheader against Guinea Bissau. The left back joined his teammates at their base today. With Sanusi's arrival, head coach Jose Pissarro now have the complement of all the 23 invited players in camp for the qualifiers. The players earlier trained at the Mashuda Biola Stadium, Abuja. The Super Eagles will keep a date with Guinea-Bissau at the Mashuda Biola Stadium, Abuja, on Friday. The three-time African champions will travel to Bissau for the reverse fixture next week, Monday. Former Arsenal, Real Madrid and a Germany midfielder, Mesut Ozil, has retired from football at the age of 34. Ozil won nine trophies during his club career, including four FA Cups and the Spanish La Liga title in 2012. He also won 92 caps for Germany and was part of the team that lifted the 2014 World Cup in Brazil. Now to tennis, Belarusian world number two, Arena Zabalenka, says she has faced hate in the locker room over a country's role in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The Australian Open champion also said she has had weird conversations with members of players' teams. Belarus is an ally of Russia and allowed troops to use its territory to launch the invasion last year. Players from both countries have been classified as neutral athletes since the start of the conflict and were banned from last year's Wimbledon. Sabalenka, who lost in the final of Indian Wells to Kazakhstan's Elena Rabiakina, on Sunday was speaking before the start of the Miami Open. Talking boxing, unified champion Alexander Yusik is set to walk away from talks with Tyson Fury over an undisputed heavyweight fight. 
The fight was to hold on the 29th of April at Wembley Stadium, and Yusik had agreed to a 70-30 split in Fury's favor. But the terms for an immediate rematch have proved a sticking point during negotiations. WBC champion Fury was against the rematch clause, while Team Music insists they did everything within their power to make the fight happen. And that's all we have for you at this hour. But before we go, here is a recap of our major stories. Alex Oti of the Labour Party has won the March 18th governorship election in Abia State. The Nigeria Labour Congress, NLC, has directed public sector workers in the country to embark on strike beginning from Wednesday next week. The Federal High Court in Abuja today dismissed an application by suspended Deputy Commissioner of Police, Abakiri, seeking to strike out drug charges against him. On the foreign scene, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has visited the front line near Bakhmut where fires fight in Bejizan. Please do follow us on our social media handles on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Western Spring Television. You can also watch us live on our YouTube channel at Western Spring Television. I am Evelyn Ohiola. Have a nice night.